Hey, I, I appreciate you all coming out this evening. Um, similar to last year, the weather does not cooperate with us. It's, if you were at the scoping meeting, we had snow that night too, so it's just something about meetings around the Telephone Gap Project. But I'm, I'm happy to have so many of you turn out um, tonight to, and have so much interest in the management of your public land. And I do want to thank all of you for your contributions to the project so far, whether that was attending a previous meeting, joining us on a field trip, coming to last year's scoping meeting, or providing us comment. Um, we, we really do appreciate that. And, and we did use all that input that we received. And if you've read the document in its, in its current fashion, you'll see that there's a couple of action alternatives that have been added. And then there's the modified proposed action. And I do want to clarify up front, because we have started to get some comments about the project in the database. And my reading of the comments, it's clear that it appears some folks are thinking that um, there is a preferred alternative at this point, and there is not. Any of those four alternatives, the no action alternative, the modified proposed, alternative C or alternative D, are all being considered equally. I have not made my decision about what alternative will be selected, so um, I just want to clarify that a little bit. And so in that modified proposed action, that re really is just correcting some things that um, we either accidentally left out of the original scoping document. Um, some changes that we made in response to comments, one of those was um, to remove the decommissioning of the Darning Needle Snowmobile Trail. We're going to keep that um, on the forest. And so that, that piece has been dropped out. Um, and then um, some clarifications in regards to acreage. So when we originally released the proposed action, we released the total stand acres, and that's what you saw, which was 11,702, I'm gonna say. That's, that's probably not the correct number. Um, so we realized that that was an overinflation. We were demonstrating to you more acres than we were actually going to harvest. So when we calculated what we were actually going to harvest, it dropped down to um, around 8,000 acres of, of harvest in the modified proposed action. And we also eliminated um, any overlay of our proposed harvest units on state designated old forest that was found within the project area. So that was also removed. So the, the what that resulted in, I can't keep track of my notes here. I'm on the wrong page. So that resulted in um, about 3,500 acres less being demonstrated to be harvested. But of that, really, there, if you wanted to look at the actual harvest acre reductions, it was only, it's about 40 acres difference from what the original proposal was. And then we also used your comments to develop alternative C, which was in response to concerns over old and mature forest that was proposed for harvest in the, in the project area. Um, and in the project area, we, we've identified um, some areas where there's some late successional habitat that's right in the cusp of becoming late successional forest. And so we proposed um, 3, roughly 3,500 acres of late successional enhancement treatments. And some of that is non-commercial treatments and some of that is commercial treatments. It just depends on what we're trying to accomplish. And then alternative D, was developed in um, response to concerns over fossil fuel use. And um, so we, we eliminated approximately 25% of the longest skid distances, units that were creating the longest skid distance. And um, that, this alternative D also includes that late successional habitat treatments. Um, and overall, it reduced the actual harvest by about 3,000 acres in alternative D. So as you can see, we've been, we've been working hard on the project to kind of refine and respond to the concerns that were expressed during the scoping. Um, some of the resources are unchanged in all of the alternatives, um, but most significantly the forest habitat and the forest health sections have significant changes in them compared to the original proposal. I'd like to thank all the folks standing around the room in the uniforms, and there's one without a uniform on here as well. Um, these are smart folks dedicated very much to the management of public land and, and their particular resources, and they have worked diligently um, looking at your comments and crafting the new alternatives that are in there and those modifications. 
Um, and then Jay, who's sitting here next to me, um, who's sort of the linchpin of all this, he, he um, took all of their edits, all of the documents, their specialist reports, the things that they worked on, and crafted them into what is a, a discernible, a decipherable document being the um, preliminary environmental assessment. And that's not an easy task to take 12 to 15 people's individual writing and make it sound like it's written with one voice. So thanks to Jay for all of his hard work here. Um, and, and lastly, I'd like to request, I have a request for you, and that is to um, make your comments on that you're going to submit on this project from a place of knowledge. Uh, make sure that you're taking the time to review the documents yourself. Don't rely on what somebody else's interpretation of it is or what you're seeing publicized in different places, but take the time to read them. It's fascinating. Um, to look at the work that's been done, and that will really be meaningful. And I, the reason I ask is that it's clear from some of the initial comments that we received already that some of, some of the folks that have commented haven't read the document. They're still referring to us with 12,000 acres of harvest, which is not in the proposal anymore, and other comments that lead me to believe that, oh, maybe they skimmed it or they didn't read it in depth. So when your comments are most valuable, and Jay's going to talk about this a little bit later, is when you're speaking from that point of knowledge, that you know what's being proposed in the project. Um, I hope you have an enjoyable evening here and take the time to visit with the resource specialists that are going to be here at the table. Um, and we'll all be available to chat with you about any part of the project um, throughout the evening. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jay. And I didn't advance my slide deck like I was supposed to. I got so involved in my comments, so I think I got that. Stop, stop there. Yeah, <laughs> I did it. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm behind you. Like, oops. Okay, hey, hi everybody. I'm Jay Strand, as Chris has already mentioned. Um, I am the uh, forest planner and the environmental coordinator for the Green Mountain and Finger Lakes National Forest. Sorry, gotta remember to talk into this microphone. Um, and I'm also the team leader for this project. Um, and uh, thank you, Chris, for the kind remarks. I, it was a hard, hard work getting everybody's um, reports into, into the environmental assessment. Whether it's discernible or not, that's questionable. I hope that it is, um, and it's understandable for you. Um, because there, were, there was a lot of uh, media information in there, so it's hard to get it to uh, read to where it can be understood by uh, folks who may not understand some of the jargon or the scientific literature that goes behind the effects disclosure. So that's exactly why you're here tonight, is to get clarification of what's in the environmental assessment uh, that was released on, on March 8th, um, and, and to browse around here and ask those questions from the people who actually wrote the, the effects disclosures that's, that's documented in the environmental assessment. Um, and so that's really what it's all about, because we want you to understand what's in that document so that you can provide us meaningful comments, feedback to us, so that we can use those to improve it for the final version, which I will go into a little bit more in detail. So understanding that some of you might be coming uh, into, this, into this process uh, sort of in the midstream, it's a little bit like watching the sequel of a movie without seeing the original pilot, right? So I just want to get everybody oriented and, and basically on the same page on where we're at today with the, with the Telephone Gap project. So, you know, just for orientation, and I know this isn't a very big map, but um, Chittenden Reservoir is right there in the middle. Uh, see if I can aim a little bit more tightly there. Right there. Uh, it's right smack in the middle of the project area. Um, and the southern boundary there, the black bold, is uh, US Highway 4 and going up to the north just a little bit to the west of the eastern boundary there is Vermont 100. So you can get an idea kind of like contextually where, where, where we're at. And to get really oriented, we're standing right here along that road right just south of the reservoir. Um, so the project area is a little over 72,000 acres total, okay, but a less a little less than half of that is actually national forest system lands, okay? So that's the only place where we are proposing activities. We're not proposing any activities on the non-national forest portions of the project area, just to be clear. Um, and a little bit 
less than half uh, is, is private. Okay, that's all that white. And then there's a smidgen of town and state land in there as well. Um, there's three primary management areas uh, within the project area. And management areas are basically like zoning, uh, zones like a, zone, like a town zone plan. Uh, those are described in our land and resource management plan that we refer to as the forest plan. And those management areas have different emphases for management and basically tell us uh, what we can and can't do is the type of activities that we can propose and implement within those sections of the national forest. So the, the diverse backcountry, remote wildlife habitat, and the diverse forest use are the three uh, majority of the area, 76% of the project area is made up of those management area allocations. And the reason why that's important to point out is those three management areas all allow some level of management uh, to take place on them. Um, they have variations, the diverse forest use, which is the light green within that project area. Uh, that allows the maximum amount of opportunity for management. And the diverse backcountry and the remote wildlife habitat are a little bit more restrictive on what we can do. Um, and so, for example, temporary openings from some of our regeneration harvests like clear cutting and shelter wood. Uh, the maximum size for the diverse forest use is 30 acres and for diverse backcountry and remote wildlife habitat, it's 20 acres, just to give you an example of some of the differences. But the, the descriptions of those management areas and what we can and can't do in them are, are fully described in our forest plan. So I just want to just really quickly uh, give you a, a National Environmental Policy Act um, you know, 101 orientation here. Very quick, just to remind you exactly what it is that we've had to do with this project and why we even had to do an environmental assessment in the first place. But NEPA is what we refer to, the, to this act as, is the acronym requires us to do two things. Primarily, the first, and maybe the most important thing, or one of the most important things, is for us to consider what the environmental effects are from a proposed activity that, we're, that, uh, that, we, that we want to move forward with on, on national forest lands. So that's a requirement of, of NEPA. And the other requirement that's equally important to that is that we have to inform those, and disclose those effects to the public, you. So the dual, dual role or the dual focus of NEPA are those, those right there in a nutshell. We disclose and consider effects and we inform you, the public, as well as Chris Atrick as the responsible official who ultimately will have to be making a decision on how to move forward with this project. He needs to understand what those effects are uh, too. Um, so what's happened since we uh, rolled out the original proposed action in January 2023, and it doesn't seem possible that that was over a year ago now, um, but a lot has happened since then. Um, first of all, after we rolled that proposed action out for a 45-day comment period, we received over 1,600 comments back from the public on what we proposed. That far exceeded any project of this level that we've done of this scope and intensity on the National Forest since we uh, started implementing the 2006 forest plan out of any of our projects. So it was quite substantial. So it took us a while to read through all those comments and we did read through all of them and we considered all of them. And what we did once we went through those comments in detail is we categorize them into resource issues of concern. And an issue of concern basically is that we've determined what part of the proposed action the comment was speaking to and the concern that they had related to that proposed activity in terms of the effect it would have on that respective resource. And that's what we're calling issues of concern. And we categorize them so that we could figure out which ones warranted consideration of alternatives to develop around that issue if, if it needed it, and also to determine and give us a focus on what we needed to include in the environmental assessment that's most meaningful to the very people who would raise those concerns in the first place, which is all part of the NEPA process. We also completed the disclosure of effects and documented it in what I'm calling the preliminary environmental assessment. It's not a draft environmental assessment, it's complete, but it is the preliminary one. It's the one that we're using for the 30-day comment period, and there will be a final version of the environmental assessment after we get done with this phase of the project. But there's four alternatives that we've included in this environmental assessment. 
Um, Chris talked about them already to some degree. I'll go into a little bit more detail. But it's the no action and three action alternatives. And I just want to point out that all proposed activities in each of those alterna action alternatives comply with the forest plan direction, including goals, objectives, the desired conditions, and forest-wide and the management area standards and guidelines. And those are all in our forest plan. We've already predetermined and, and made sure when we were developing the activities in each of these alternatives that they comply with that direction. So that should be a given. Um, I just wanted to talk about that very quickly because sometimes there's confusion about what standards and guidelines are in the forest plan, how they compare with design features, which are part of our preliminary environmental assessment, and then yet again, confusion with mitigation measures, which are also in our environmental assessment. So I'm going to speak to that very quickly to try and clarify any confusion that might be, um, that might be swirling around about those three terms. So standards and guidelines, the relevant ones anyway, are already required for us to, like I said, to be incorporated into our proposed action. And those are all included in chapter two in the forest plan. And an example for, for that would be, um, there, there's, there's a lot of them. There's like types of, of requirements to leave wildlife, uh, uh, wildlife leave trees and den trees and cavity trees, buffers along stream courses and buffers around wetlands to, be, to, to give you a few examples. Those are required and those are givens that we will impl implement those in the ground if we are to, to actually move forward with any of the action alternatives. And then we have design features and design features are basically protective measures that we've incorporated into the actual description of the proposed action. It's appendix A in the preliminary environmental assessment, okay? And they're basically we've incorporated them up front. And some examples there would be some additional protective measures specific to, um, to the uh, Indiana bat and to the northern long-eared bat, which both are endangered species. And then that brings us to mitigation measures. And mitigation measures are protective measures that specialists identified when they were conducting their environmental analysis, okay? They didn't know about them or didn't think they might need them when we were developing the proposed action. They came up with these when they were conducting their effects analysis and determined that they were needed to mitigate or to offset some of the potentially adverse effects to their resource from some part of the proposed action. All three of these things together collectively are protective measures. But I just wanted to point you out to the difference of where they're coming from. The, the standards and guidelines are given. We don't repeat those in the environmental assessment, but the design features are Appendix A, and the mitigation measures are Appendix B in the environmental assessment. So I'm gonna to speak to about alternatives because alternatives are really kind of the heart of the environmental document. And the reason why they're important um, is because when they're included for detailed analysis in the environmental assessment, they're built around to address some major issue of concern. And there were some major issues of concern that came out of the public uh, commenting process. Um, and so the reason why alternatives are important is because resource specialists have disclosed their effects for those different alternatives, and the, you as the public and Chris as the responsible official for the project can see the specific trade-offs between alternatives specific to that issue of concern that the alternative was developed to address in the first place. So it's a really, really important part of a NEPA document. For the, for the telephone gap environmental assessment, like I said, there's four alternatives included for detailed analysis in the document. The no action, which is required by NEPA, it's the baseline. It's, 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 we won't be doing anything under the no action alternative. Um, none of the proposed activi activities that we proposed in the proposed action would take place. It, it uh, serves as the baseline for the action alternatives to compare the effects of those action alternatives as if not, uh, compared to what would happen if nothing occurred on the landscape. And then we have alternative B, and Chris talked about that. It's, it's basically uh, relatively unchanged um, from the original proposal that we rolled out in January of 2023, but there are quite a few small changes that are worth to note. I'm not gonna list them all here. He already talked about some of the major ones, um, but those are in section 2.2 .2 in the environmental assessment, chapter two. And the chapter two describes all of the alternatives. 
Alternative C is, is um, an alternative that, that Chris had mentioned earlier. We developed that to address uh, concerns uh, associated with harvesting mature and old forests in the landscape, including their impacts to their capacity to store carbon. Um, that was a big issue that came out of a lot of the comments that we received during the 45-day comment period. Um, so we developed an alternative that dropped about 660 acres uh, of stands that were proposed in alternative B from harvest. We're not going to harvest them at all. They're not proposed. They've been eliminated from the, this particular alternative altogether. They were exhibiting or show characteristics of late forest uh, habitat, late, for, late successional forest uh, conditions, um, moving towards old growth conditions. Okay, so we've eliminated those or dropped them from this alternative. And then some of the acres uh, were, that are retained for harvest have a different type of civil cultural treatment that are designed to enhance late successional forest characteristics or attributes which within those stands. So they're modified civil cultural treatments and even include some non-commercial treatments. Um, to enhance those attributes on the landscape. And then there's, there's also some acres that were retained with more traditional civil cultural methods, I'll refer to them as more traditional, that were described um, and being implemented, or I should say proposed in alternative B. And then alternative D um, takes it one step further. It has all of the, uh, of the um, changes that I just mentioned for alternative C. It takes it one step further. It reduces more stands from harvest to eliminate the need to skid the timber, uh, uh, um, the, the distances it would be necessary compared to alternative B and C to reduce the amount of fossil fuel emissions from actually implementing the project. So the skidders and the and the, and the trucks and the haul trucks and things of that nature, we're trying to eliminate or reduce the amount of, of carbon that's being emitted or emitted as a result of, of them burning fossil fuels to actually implement the project. So that's what alternative D is all about. So alternative C compared to B drops about, I would say, I think off the top of my head, <laughs> it's about 11% of the overall acres uh, that are proposed for treatment in B. There's an 11% dip decrease in alternative C, and then alternative D decreases it down to about 33 or 34%, just to give you a little idea of the difference. The focus of the analysis is the other important part of how we use those issues of concern that I talked about that we derive from your public comments. And so this environmental assessment, like I said, is quite thick with a lot of information and a lot of numbers and a lot of tables. But what you'll find in there, and it, those of you who've already tried to take a look at it or who have taken a look at it, um, you'll see that we've disclosed effects related to forest habitat, um, to composition and age class of the forest within the, within the areas that, uh, that we're proposing for harvest, and also any effects related to the mature and old forest uh, resource that are within the project area. But also talk about wildlife habitat in that, sec in that section of the, of the environmental assessment. We tried to include, or we did include, effects related to forest health, including insects and diseases and in non-native invasive plants. That's included in the environmental assessment as well. There's a section in there um, where we disclosed effects related to carbon, and that includes the sequestration um, the, the storage capacity as well as carbon emissions directly related and indirectly related to our, to our proposed activities. Um, and sequestration, by the way, um, just in case you didn't know, is, is basically the, it's the process of trees removing carbon from the atmosphere through when they conduct photosynthesis. So they remove carbon from the atmosphere, they sequester it, and store it as carbon in the woody parts of, of the tree, the leaves, the branches, and the roots of the tree is where that carbon is stored. Um, and so what we've done in this effects analysis is we've disclosed the effects of, uh, as far as the emissions, we quantified the emissions of carbon um, from biogenic and fossil fuel sources. And biogenic sources are the actual cutting of trees and the prescribed burning of the area because there is some prescribed fire uh, as part of our proposed activities. And then from the fossil fuel end of things, the actual uh, emissions from the machinery that we would be using, including chainsaws. Um, to implement the project. And that's all, project, all parts of the project, including trail construction, road maintenance, parking lot construction, as well as harvesting timber. 
And so as far as I know, this environmental assessment is the first environmental assessment where we have quantified the emissions from cutting trees at the stand or at the project level. It's the first time that this has been done. So what you'll find in the environmental analysis is, is, is uh, a, really, um, a really holistic, pretty detailed uh, quantification of carbon effects. There's a section to talking about effects related to threatened, endangered, and sensitive wildlife and plant species. Water, wetlands, fishery, soil, and air quality are also included in there. And last but, well, not last, not last but not least, we have recreation visuals and roadless areas. They're included. But last, last but not least, heritage and socioeconomics. So you can see, taken together, there is a lot of information in this environmental assessment. And these were all derived from issues of concern from the public. Every single one of these resources was touched upon to some level by public comments. I will point out, though, that forest habitat, mature and old forest, and carbon had the most comments associated with those issues. So you will find more detail of analysis in, that, in those sections of the environmental assessment than in some of the others. So that said, what do I start to do as far as reviewing that document to be able to start to think about what I might even be able to comment on? Obviously, look at the environmental assessment. Gay, um, Chris actually mentioned right up front, you know, make sure you read it. Don't take somebody else's word for it or somebody else's cliff notes about what they think they've read. Read it for yourself. And there's no less than seven project maps that are associated with this environmental assessment that show you where these activities are proposed to take place on the landscape. There is an appendices um, that is equally important to look at. It includes those design features and mitigation measures I mentioned, as well as a complete set of treatment tables that provide information on st the, the ages of the forested stands that we're proposing treatments in, their total stand acres, and the actual acres that would be affected if we were to, to actually implement those treatments. There's a detailed modif modified proposed action document. Please look at that, um, because the version that's in the actual environmental assessment is just a summary of the modified proposed action. The modified detailed version of the modified proposed action has a very, uh, long, pretty exhaustive description and narrative of what it is that we're proposing to do. Um, so be sure you look at that because you might miss some important information if you just looked at the environmental assessment itself. Now, last but not least, this is a lot of information to soak in, but there's a lot of supporting information that you can look at that will help you uh, better understand what's in the actual environmental assessment itself. And there's, there's a long list of stuff here. I'm not going to talk about them all in detail here. But um, the one that I do want to, a couple that I do want to point out is that there's a consideration of comments document. Um, and it, it talks about and lists every single one of the issues and concerns that we derive from public comments and shows how we addressed it in the environmental assessment. And if we didn't address it in the environmental assessment, it provides the rationale why we didn't. So it's a good place to go to find out perhaps where the comment that you submitted was addressed in the environmental assessment. There's also a document called Alternatives Considered but Not Included for Detailed Analysis. I didn't put it all on this slide, but that's the name of the document. And it lists all of the suggested and requested modifications to the proposed action and alternatives to the proposed action from public comments. And it lists all of those suggestions and requests and shows how we included them in one of our alternatives, and if we didn't, why we didn't. And it's also a good place to go to see where you are. Specific comments may have been addressed in the environmental assessment, and if not, why we chose not to. There's other things on there. There's, there's a good one on uh, how we conducted our carbon analysis. It's, it gives you a little bit more substantiation to what's actually in the environmental assessment, a little bit more context, I should say. Um, there's an overall forest carbon assessment. It shows and talks about in great detail 
the past, present, and future trends of carbon stocks existing on the Green Mountain National Forest, and when I mean carbon stocks, the actual amount of carbon that's being stored in living woody material on the forest, living ecosystem. Um, it's, a, it's a really good document to refer to. And then there's biological evaluations that address effects associated with threatened, endangered, and sensitive plant and wildlife species. So where can I find all those, you may be asking? Um, they are on our website, and you've probably figured this out uh, by now. Um, when we rolled out the, uh, the notification and sent out the emails and the hardcover letters for those who don't have email addresses, we included a link to the project website where you can find all this information. And that's where we would encourage you to go because we know that there's limitations on internet and internet capacity, in, especially in a lot of the nooks and crannies of Vermont, right? And so the best we could do for you folks, uh, I wish we could do better, but we have provided hard copies and delivered them to three town offices, Menden, Pittsfield, and, and right down the road here in Chittenden. Um, a complete set of documents and maps for you to go in and look at if you can't look at them online. And we've realized that there's some limitations for some of you. Um, we also have a copy at our Rochester office in, um, in Rochester and uh, at our Menden office right up the road on uh, Highway 4. I think we still do, <laughs> don't we? Yes, we do, okay. So be sure and uh, check in with those offices before you, the town offices and the Forest Service offices, make sure they're open before you take the time to go visit and uh, look at those hard version copies. If you don't look at them online um, at home or at the library or at some other place where you can actually access this information online. There's also a story map online. Um, and the story map online and the link is on that cover letter I mentioned to you that was sent out on March 8th to our mailing list. So if you didn't get one, there's a copy of the, of the cover letter up front at the table. Uh, where you checked in, um, but uh, it, it gives you a visual display of the action alternatives uh, that are talked about and, and discussed in the, in the environmental assessment. A really nice tool uh, to give that visual display of uh, what's occurring within the project area in terms of what we're proposing. So this is a really important part, and I, I don't want to like go too quickly. I'm eating into your valuable time to ask questions from our specialists, but I don't want to, to glaze over this too quickly because I want you to make sure that you understand um, you know, how to submit written comments to us so that we can actually have them in hand and consider them and move up onto the next phase of this, this project uh, process. And so on page two of that cover letter I've been referring to, that we have copies up here that you can grab if you don't have one. Um, outlines exactly how you can submit your written comments. Uh, it's, it's on the page two back of that, that cover letter. Um, we really, really would encourage you to use our online commenting system. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more of that in detail in a second. Um, because that is the easiest way for us to uh, access and to do an analysis of your of your comments and start to derive or figure out what the issues of concerns are. It's the easiest way and the most efficient way for us to do that. So if you can do, if you can do your comments that way, that would be best. Um, but we realize also that there's other means to do that and those are totally acceptable. Good old fashioned post office mail, just drop it in the mail. Um, we do still have a fax machine in our office so you can fax it uh, to us or you can even drop it by and hand deliver it. Just make sure that you uh, call the office ahead of time and make sure um, that we're open. Um, and usually we're open between 8 and 4.30, Monday through Friday, excluding holidays. This is important. You must submit your comments by the end of the comment period, which is April 8th. And it's 11.59 p.m. We did not make that up. It's in the administrative review regulations, so it actually is in there. You need to be able to have to submit those comments by 11.59 p.m. by the end of that last day of the comment period in order for your comments to be considered to give you standing for objections. And I'm gonna talk about that um, in, in a couple slides here. It doesn't mean you can't submit comments later than that. You can, and we still will consider them, but they won't give you the same uh, eligibility for standing to object to the project once we get to the draft decision stage of the project process. 
Submitting comments online is, is pretty easy and straightforward. The directions are all in there. But if you go to that project website that I've been talking about, and on the right-hand panel, it just says comments. There's a link there. You just press on it. This page will pop up. And uh, you, know, you just fill out that information. It's your name, address, contact information, email, uh, phone number if you want to put it in there. And then you can drop your, your comment here in the text box or attach a document and just submit it, and we've got it. It's in there. Um, and it's, it's pretty easy to use, and uh, a lot of folks have already used it. We've got about 50 comments in the, in the inbox on our online system as we speak. So what are meaningful comments once we, uh, once we get to a place where you're actually sitting down and putting the pencil to the paper, so to speak? Um, be as specific as possible. Chris, Chris allude to the, alluded to this at the introduction. Um, try to be as specific as you can because the, the less specific and the more general they are, the more difficult it is for us to identify what your concern really is. So the more specific, the better. It has to have a direct relationship with the proposed activity or any of the alternatives. If it's something related to something that we're not proposing in any of those action alternatives, we can't address it in this environmental assessment. It's just really that simple. So keep it specific to a direct relationship to some activity we're proposing in any of the action alternatives. Identify any perceived analysis gaps. Okay, this is an important one. Um, you may disagree with our effects analysis. That's, that would be perceived as a gap. Um, or we just flat, off, flat out miss something that you think should be included. That's something that we would like to hear about from you. Give us the reason why you think it, okay? Give us some rationale, um, because the line officer, Chris Madrick, the responsible official, will use that when he's considering uh, what decision to make at the end of the day. This last one is include your name and contact information if you want to have objection standing, okay? You can submit your comments anonymously. That's totally acceptable. Um, it just won't allow you to have object objection standing. And, and to be clear, if you put in the online system your um, personal inf contact information, that will not show on the website. There's a reading room that you all can go in on that same web page, and right below the, the, the link to get to the commenting page, there's a reading room link. You can go and read all the comments as they come in in real time. Um, nobody's personal information is going to be there. So nobody's going to be able to see that unless you put it into the content of your comments. Okay, so if you're just putting them in that, in that um, initial boxes and filling out the, the personal information, that stuff isn't going to show up. And we will not put any of that on the website. It will be part of the project record, though. But it will not ever be made public. So. It's important for you to know what those meaningful uh, comments are for you when you're putting your ideas on paper because the more meaningful they are, the more we can consider them and make changes to the final environmental assessment, which is where we go from here. That's the next step. We'll consider any additional needed analysis, corrections, clarifications that need to go into the final version of an environmental assessment that we hope to have complete by June 2024. That's this summer. Okay, that's what we're targeting for. Um, you'll notice that I have draft decision notice, okay, because together with that final environmental assessment, Chris Matrick will also distribute a draft decision notice, which will show what his preferred alternative will be at that time, okay, and he also will tentatively determine at that point that there's no significant impact from the proposed activities, okay. That's called the finding of no significant impact. Now, we didn't put that in as part of the preliminary EA because it's premature for him to make that finding, that determination. So between now and then, if something pops up that appears to him that it's going to be resulting in a significant effect, it'll automatically trigger the need to conduct an environmental impact statement. But as, as it stands right now, unless Chris corrects me on the spot, it doesn't seem that we're headed in that direction. Okay, so that's important to understand. And then when that draft decision notice, final EA, and tentative finding of no significant impact are distributed for public review, it triggers a 45-day objection period that I've 
I've referred to several times now, up till now. So this is where I'll talk about it in a little bit of detail, but it can get a little bit of wonky and complicated uh, and confusing, believe me. <laughs> so that's why I'm here, and you can ask me any questions that you might have about it over here at my resource table. But the point there is, is that you have a 45-day period. If you've submitted written comments in any of the oppor formal opportunities to submit co written comments, and that would include the 45-day comment period back in January 2023, and this current one that we're in right now up until April 8th, if you submit comments during any of those, those periods of time, you will have eligibility to object, as long as your name and contact information can be associated with those comments. So depending on how the objection review goes um, and what the outcome of that process is, um, we would hope to have a final decision notice uh, we might have to address some objection issues, maybe not, we don't know. Uh, we'll find out when we get there. But uh, depending on what happens, we hope to have a decision notice uh, complete by the early, uh, late summer or early fall of 2024, which puts us in a position of implementing a project if Chris decides to actually select an action alternative um, by the end of this year or sometime in early 2025. So let's get on with the open house format and uh, stop listening to me talk up here and you can get on with your actual reason why you came here, which is to talk with our resource specialists and get clarification on any part of the environmental assessment that you so desire. That's what it's all about. Walk around freely. We have resource tables behind us. They're gonna be staffed by very smart resource specialists that are on staff with the Forest Service. Um, and this is where you can go to get your answers uh, to some of your questions that you might have. Um, we have a table set up to talk about forest habitat and ecology. It'll be staffed by our forest ecologist, um, Suzanne Gifford. Raise your hand, please. Suzanne. Um, she'll be at that table along with our district silviculturist and timber sale forester, James Donahue and Dave Haberl over here, over here. They'll be talking about any of those harvest treatments that you might have questions about, as well as some of those late successional habitat enhancement or condition uh, enhancement uh, treatments that, that I mentioned for alternatives C and D. We will have a table set up to talk about soil, wetlands, and water from our watershed program manager, John McCann, and botany, including sensitive plants and non-native invasive plants, will be Mel Melissa Green, Mel Green, um, we'll have a table set up right over here, um, staffed by our fisheries and wildlife biologist, um, Jeremy Mears, and Lindsay Ray Sylvia will talk about uh, fire and air quality. She is our fire and fuels specialist on the district. And uh, Jeremy, yep, there you go, thank you. We've got a table set up to talk about visuals, special uses by Holly Knox, our recreation staff person <laughs> she changes positions too much i can't keep up and uh katie curry katie where are you katie she's going to help talk about recreation um we have a table at, at that same table jacob carringer jacob he'll talk to you about visuals uh resources and the recreation opportunity spectrum um and at the same table we have allison borchers over here She's been kind enough to join us from our regional staff. Um, she's a regional economist. She can talk to you about anything that you might have questions about regarding socioeconomics. And then we'll have a table to talk about transportation and infrastructure questions, anything about roads or the parking lots, anything of that nature. Uh, our forest engineer, Brian Austin, over here, will be at that table. And we have two forest archeologists here. Um, Karen Booters and Sarah Skinner, they're over there. They'll be on that table along with Brian over on this end of the room. Then we have a table where we will have Todd Antel, who's a carbon specialist from the Office of Sustainability and Carbon out of our Washington office. And he works remotely out of Maine. <laughs> where are you, Todd? Todd, there you go. Todd is, is uh, he'll, he'll be able to answer some questions if you have any about that carbon analysis. And they really were instrumental, the Office of Sustainability and Climate, very instrumental in helping us quantify 
uh, carbon emissions from timber harvesting. Um, and I'll be at that same table to talk about anything regarding roadless areas. There's one inventory roadless area called the Pittenden roadless area that was reviewed uh, during our forest plan revision. It was not recommended for wilderness designation. It was allocated to the wildlife, uh, remote wildlife habitat management area. So that's what guides our management direction within that area. But I will talk about the effects to the roadless character if you have any questions about that at my table. I'll also be there to talk about anything you might have uh, questions you might have about the forest plan or the NEPA process in general. So anyway, that's my spiel. There's a lot to take in. I apologize, I was probably way too windy. Um, but it was important to go over some of those uh, parts of the process, especially how to submit comments, pay attention to that deadline, and how to, how to formulate your comments so that they're most meaningful for us to consider to make changes in the final environmental assessment. So thank you. And I think with that, unless there's any general questions about process or anything, um, it's time to break into our tables. <laughs>